Thank you. It's a little bit different talk, um, and I just want to make a few points. I'm going to try to go fast because I want to prove to Sean Todd that I can give a talk without going over, and uh, I'm promising him that. Um, and also, we're behind, I think. So, I I, I want to just make a a couple of uh, broad points, and one is that we are we've been doing a, a study called Seals of Sentinels. Now it's now it's like actually 10 years, and I hate hearing that because I'm feeling that aging effect myself. But um, we are the only group doing this kind of extensive region-wide study uh, using pinnipeds, primarily harbor seals. So we're looking at all kinds of contaminants and stranded and live seals. Uh, the, the data that's being produced, we're producing papers. I have some of the publications here with me. And um, this, the information we are producing is actually being used to change toxics policy in Maine, where we're located, and throughout uh, the uh, country. Um, and this is a NOAA-funded project. And I hope that as you all, we go through this, I want to give you just an update on what we're finding, how it compares with what other people are finding in pinnipeds around the world, what are some of the, the compounds we're worried about. And also, I want to just thank you, um, I take the opportunity to thank you. I hope that you feel in some way that this is your study, because we couldn't do this without you. We have to have the tissues in order to look for the contaminants. And you've all contributed tissues. I want to particularly thank, and we thank you in our papers, so you can look for that. Uh, but uh, of course, Rosie and Sean have been fantastic working with us closely. We work under the, their uh, permit. Keith Matassa, Katie Tui, uh, Linda Dowdy, Robin Kim, and Belinda Rubenstein. So, um, what are we worried about? Um, the, there are what's called legacy uh, chemicals, the persistent organic pollutants, like PCBs, dioxins, the pesticides, DDT. These are organic chlorine chemicals that were banned in the 1970s, but they're so persistent in the environment that they're still cycling through food webs, and they're, we find them at high uh, levels still in marine mammals. What we're really worried about now are these emerging contaminants. These are chemicals that are in use every, in our everyday lives. The brominated flame retardants, which are in all kinds of um, furniture and household products, and the perfluorinated compounds that are also <coughs> in our daily <coughs> uh, products that we use. So these are the flame retardants. They're in uh, all the foam chairs you're sitting on. They're in all, all kinds of foam furniture, foam in the interiors of cars, airplanes, trains, uh, backings on carpets. They're in uh, clothing. They're in the hard plastic casings of your computer. When you get dust on the screen of your computer and you take a, a, a wipe of it, this is full of brominated compounds. Um, they're also present in the, uh, in the environment, in the oceans, and in fish and other food. And then the perfluorinated chemicals are the other big class of emerging contaminants I'm not going to particularly talk much about today, but just to mention just how common these <coughs> compounds are, and they are toxic. They are carcinogens, the um, flame retardants and the PFCs cause endocrine disruption. They um, induce enzymes in, in the process of cancer. They particularly target the, the thyroid and they're neurotoxic to developing um, animals and people. So what's been happening um, since the PCBs, DDT, the organic chlorines were banned in the 70s, the levels have generally been going down and we find this in marine mammal tissue, whereas these new compounds are steadily rising, and particularly in North America, because with our affluent society, we've been using more of these compounds than anywhere else in the world. So there's a really an alarming increase in all wildlife and all people of these compounds in um, Canada and the United States. And I had my blood tested in 2007, and I, had load, I was loaded with these compounds, which didn't make me very happy. Uh, so how did they get from the 
indoor products to the environment. It's a kind of complicated process, but um, they're going from, say, the, the home, the office, from these products that we use that have a, a long lifetime into landfills, the dust, the, the, um, these, every uh, foam, piece of foam furniture eventually, through wear and tear, breaks down and uh, emits dust. Carpets emit dust. The dust is loaded with the flame retardants, and I'm going to refer to these as the, po the, the main uh, group of those are the polyruminated diphenyl ethers, or PBDEs. Those are the main bad actors. So it gets into the dust, goes through the wastewater of the home, into wastewater treatment plants. It goes into electronic waste when we throw out our computers and TVs, um, eventually reaching surface waters, migrating through the environment, and finding the final sink, which is the oceans. Uh, that's why marine mammals carry very, very high levels of these compounds, because they're at the top of the ocean food chain. So these chemicals and others have been hitting the news very recently. You're going to be hearing much more about this. Finally, at the uh, top level, we do need a top-down solution for this big, big problem. At the top level, alarm bells are being rung about the relationship between cancer and the load of chemicals that we all carry in our tissues and marine mammals and other wildlife carry. So there's just been a couple of even in the Gulf of Mexico spill that we've been talking about, they're actually applying chemical dispersants, which are moderately to, to very toxic. These, the ones that I've been uh, looking into, one of them ruptures red blood cells when ingested. They're pouring these things into the 160,000 gallons of, of this dispersant into on top of the oil to contain the oil. They're going miles under the water to inject the, these dispersants into the water. So, of course, mammals are going to be ingesting this dispersant, ruptures, ruptures red blood cells, and causes kidney and liver damage. So I have been, I'm actually commenting on this, and uh, we are responding to a whole thing in the New York Times. But it's scary what's happening, because we're pouring more chemicals on top of the oil. It's not just death by oil. It's also what these animals are going to be, be um, taking into their bodies. So here's some of our results. I want to go as quickly as I can. I know Sean is watching. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, we are collecting tissues from many of you, uh, generously helping with this. And it, we're, we have animals stretching from Canada down to the coastline of New York. So at, to date, in these years, we've analyzed over 400 chemicals in about 500 tissues from 181 animals, from both live and stranded animals. And you can see there's a whole suite of compounds we've analyzed. And we started with the PCBs, the DDTs. So just to give you a comparison, um, I don't know if I have a pointer, but um, anyway, in the red, the red bars are our guys the harbor seals from the Northwest Atlantic. And you're looking at mean values in, um, in this case, in adult males and, oh, good, okay, great. Okay, so we have, um, this is the adult males and pups, the mean of 55 and 54 parts per million in blubber on a lipid weight basis. So that's parts per million. So you have in the Baltic, and over in the Caspian Sea and uh, in the Mediterranean, th those are the only places in the world where pinnipeds have higher levels than the PCB levels in our animals. Um, looking at DDT, our levels are probably lower than the uh, levels on the Pacific coast in pinnipeds, 22 parts per million in blubber, and much lower than uh, levels in the, this is in the Casp Caspian Seals, 143 parts per million. That's because of the continued use of DDT in Russia. There's been a lot of new studies on uh, these flame retardants in pinnipeds and from many, many regions, including our study in the harbor seals. I wanted to show you a comparison of what everybody's been finding. Um, and the trend is that 
we have much higher levels here in the U.S. than anywhere else in the world. These are just off the map for the rest of the world. You can see compared to Europe, Canada, Asia. And this is our study where the harbor seals have, this would be um, on a parts per million level, it would be 3.7, but it's, we are now in parts per billion level. We're looking at 3,700 mean. In, um, this is in the pups and the adult males again. Um, it, is, it is very uh, striking that out in California, uh, the levels in California sea lines from a new study this year are the highest in the world. And I'll show you what that looks like. Here are our levels, 3,700 nanograms per gram lipid weight. In our harbor seals and in California in the sea lions, you see um, this study off of LA. I think it's where Keith Mutasa was before, but this is the highest level ever reported in any wildlife species on the face of the planet. And that is 55 parts per million. It's 55,000 parts per billion. But that is, we're surpassing now the levels of PCBs in marine mammals with these PBDs. Um, so we, we reported our data and um, wrote a paper and brought up the fact that we, the good news is that our harbor seals are not going to be bursting into flame anytime soon. So this is, we want to look on the good side, right? And we did, uh, we did turn up this finding of the neurotoxic, uh, there are three commercial P PBDE mi mixtures in use. There were, they have been now banned. But we found this neurotoxic one called DECA. And then very, uh, very subsequent to that, the legislature in Maine took this up and banned DECA from uh, furniture, it's in foam, baby products, and now this year in shipping pallets. And our data got some, uh, you know, some media play because it was, this is very, a very hard uh, compound to find at the end tissue. Um, in cetaceans, there are many uh, new studies as well on uh, PBDEs, beluga whales, harbor porpoise, killer whales, bottlenose dolphins, white-sided dolphins, and striped dolphins, and these are all new studies. So looking at the comparison worldwide, again, the trend is very high levels in the United States, and um, this is off the California coast and, the, and then the Puget Sound area. And it's interesting, um, this is our, uh, we, yeah. okay, it's interesting that in the killer whales, you see the highest levels in the United States, right? And the killer whales that are, that are the transients here that are pretty much migrating up and down the coast and they're feeding on sea lions. They have the highest levels of all cetacean. Why? Because they're at the highest trophic level and they're eating marine mammals. Okay, so I was showing you that uh, PVDs in general are going up in North American wildlife and people exponentially, and it, uh, it's kind of scary. Uh, but in marine mammals now, we have some studies, including ours, showing that they are, seem to be leveling off. So we, we do not see any declines, by the way, but we are seeing leveling off. It could mean that they are at equilibrium in the, in the uh, food webs. So what are the toxic effects? And um, I have rather detailed slides, but I'm going to just give you the take-home message there. Many studies have, are now showing toxic effects in animals and in people. These are the main uh, ones. Uh, in the mink, with, uh, the, the mammal, uh, it's close to a marine mammal, uh, complete reproductive failure at a fairly low dose. And this is interesting because this does have no effect on, on rodents, on rats and mice. So the mink is a very sensitive uh, species to these compounds. Uh, you also, we also saw, see, sorry, um, almost a DDT-like effect in American kestrels with eggshell thinning uh, and reproductive, no reproductive success. Um, at a fairly, at a level at which we see this is in the eggs. We can find uh, many populations with levels where you, um, 
would see an effect. And this is the same story in osprey and peregrine falcons, a, a reproductive uh, impairment. And in harbor porpoise, there's a study showing, um, indicating lymphoid depletion in two, th two ways, thymic atrophy and, and splenic depletion in relation to um, PBDEs, which, and also PCBs, or maybe an additive effect. And then there's studies in uh, seals, and I was telling you that these uh, compounds target the thyroid gland, so we do see thyroid hormone disruption in gray seals and harbor seals. <clears throat> and Elsa Hall did a recent study showing that PBDs uh, significantly reduce first year survival in gray seal pups. Now one of the reasons probably is that these compounds hit the, the immune system and they target the brain in developing animals and people. And in people, you see actually, there's a new study showing children have IQ deficits at age one, two, three, four, and six. Some of, uh, at age four, they, lo they have lost as much as five to 11 points of IQ, which is really significant for later performance in college and so forth. Um, but in animals, um, this neurotoxic effect in a young animal could um, cause the animal to have, be unsuccessful at, at weaning in try, trying to de develop foraging patterns and survival. So um, again, we don't know why, but that is the, the prevailing thought. Uh, so what, are, what, are, what we're now attacking is that because the PBDEs have been banned because they're so toxic, persistent, and bioaccumulative, they've been listed now under the Stockholm Convention as POPs recently. But what, what's the, what the companies are doing are replacing those PBDEs in foam furniture with compounds that are very similar in structure and probably have a similar effect and a similar persistence, but we don't know. They, these are not well studied. So this is one of the failures of our regulatory system for chemicals, which I'm not going to get into, but you'll, you're going to be hearing a lot about that in the national news. So there's an array of chemicals that are now being marketed aggressively as safe replacements. But the, the, the catch is the companies do not have to provide any data showing that they're safe before they market them. It's rather the government's job to do all the studies and people like us to do the studies to show that these compounds are widespread contaminants in the environment, they're bioaccumulating, they're toxic. And by the time we do all that, then they take them off the market and put something else on which resembles very closely what they have just withdrawn. So this has to stop that we are really up for a policy reform in a big way. So the new Mary study is looking at these emerging contaminants that are replacements for the banned compounds. They've been detected in marine mammals in San Francisco Bay and elsewhere, and we are now looking for them in harbor seal tissue, so we're asking you all to help us with that study. Okay. Um, we have a tissue request out, uh, and please get in touch with us if you'd like to collaborate on the study. We really do want collaborators. We know that some of you have interest in this, and please just get in touch. We have our protocols are circulated, and, and call, and we'll talk to you about it and, and try to get you involved in an active way. Um, so to summarize, these compounds are getting into the oceans, they're in the deep oceans, their levels are surpassing PCBs and marine mammals, our seals are highly contaminated by the compounds, they are high, they're toxic, and then the replacement chem chemicals come along, so we are getting hit again. Uh, thanks to all my uh, collaborators, including all of you, uh, Michelle Berger, Megan Dwyer, Kirk Trevant at Mary, and um, uh, for our laboratories that are doing chemical analysis. And uh, thank you for your time.